today on this old house. So we are finally here today to put the front landscape in. Excellent choice for this corner. And this is the CNC machine. This is what we're going to use to machine out the countertop. Five roofs, yeah. all different pitches. Yeah, and you've got a lot going on. You really see the complexity of it all once it's framed. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house and our not so small 1880s Cape, where for the first time we can get a good sense of what this addition is all about. There is a lot going on behind me, so let me give you a tour. Here at the very back of the house is just a one story room. This is gonna be an office and it's kind of private, shielded from the main house and behind the mass of the house. And then here, you've got the big addition. Now this was all framed up over the last week. They brought a big truck filled with these eye joists in. They had to fly each one of those in place and lay it down on these walls. They also brought in a big steel I-beam as well. That one had to be brought into place with the lull. And then when all of that structure was down, they laid the sheathing down, tongue and groove, banged it together, nailed it down, and that gave us the deck for the second floor but it also gave us this beautiful space right here, this long hallway with square windows looking out onto the backyard. And then on this side, we've got a two bay garage and then an additional third bay that's gonna be a mudroom area right here. And you can see one of the reasons why we've got so much structure up top. There is not a single post through this entire space. As we push to the front of the house, we end up with a door to the outside deck right there, what's going to be a beautiful dining room and a wall of glass right there, and then we continue on to what is really the main event of this house, the most modern part and the most glass. This wall right here, which you can see is going to be all glass, that went up last week. It is big enough and heavy enough that we had to lift it in two stages. We go one, two, three, nice and easy. Up once onto the sawhorses, and then a whole bunch of us to push it up to this space. Nice, nice. After that, this wall went up too. There's a lot of glass in that one, but they were able to get it up with just five guys in one continuous lift. This is going to be a big, beautiful vaulted ceiling, lots of different roof lines that get kind of complicated, but you can see it's also where it gets tied into the old house. More big posts and beams and a lot of lumber right in there. And then in this space, there's going to be a staircase. So it's going to run up here to the second floor, down to the lower level. And then in this corner of the house, you can sort of see where the new meets the old. I mean, we've got eye joists and LVLs tied into the original ceiling joists right here. And even down here on the floor, you can see the new sheathing where it gets tied into the old planks. It is literally where the old house and the new house sort of kind of mesh together. On the second floor, we've got some new rooms framed out, but this is the interesting part. This new ridge beam, which went in last week, it's carrying the roof of the old house, but it's also gonna carry all of the weight of the new roof because right here, this is where all of the new space starts. We've never had a deck going out to the new addition. So that's a complicated roof line. And then this hallway right here, that was created when they framed up these walls. They were flowing in in two sections and then they were joined with that top plate. And then after that, they raised both of these gable ends, the one on the far side as well as this one right here. And you could tell that the framers were excited to finally get the gable ends up. And just about an hour or two ago, the ridge beam came in. That's a double LVL, runs about 35 feet end to end. And Tommy, it is great to finally see so much activity going on. Yeah, once the framing gets cut and starts to go together like a puzzle, it really goes together quick. But I mean, think about it. We've got a big floor here for the master bedroom and also the master bathroom. Bedroom here, bathroom in the back. Right, and the ceiling in the garage or the floor, you, we've done a lot of eye joists that run from the outside wall to the bearing wall and then again to the outside wall again. Yep. Now the building code allows us to basically just use an eye joist like this. This is what's specced in the plans and this is approved by the building code. So these are two by three top and bottom flange, but we wanted to stiffen that floor up to take any of the bounce out of it 
and change it to two by four top and bottom flange, which would really make a difference and take some of the deflection out of the floor. A lot of structure down there, including steel. Right. Well, the floor joists, the eye joists, are carrying the floor, but you can't put a bearing load like a wall or a ridge beam on it. So right here, we inserted a steel beam into the joist system. And that steel beam has to rest on a post in the wall below, yep. and that post goes down onto the foundation below. So that gets transferred up, over, two posts up, a header, and then to the ridge beam, which cuts this span down and really shares the load. So where, where are the posts in this space right here? Well, That's as like you enter the bathroom. Oh, there's a wall here, there's I got you. There's a wall right here, oh, okay. so you got a post going up here, post going up here, and an engineered post okay, going up right, here. Cool. And then what is called a ridge pole going up to the underside of the ridge. I, I get it. What I don't get, though, is this roof line back yeah, here. Yeah, it's tricky. We've got the new ridge beam that's gone up there, and that travels all over to the old part of the house right there. Now that we have that ridge beam up there, we can get that valley rafter or beam that's going to go in here to connect these roof rafters down. And then we'll frame the roof that comes across here that goes the other direction. Then there's going to be another roof system that comes down here and down onto the valley rafter and onto that flat section of the roof right over wow. there. To get all the water out of that valley, we're going to frame this triangular shaped roof here that's going to be pitched down and over to about five feet of the chimney and take the water and push it around and out the sidewall. And the illustration says it all. I mean, each one of these little roofs has got a different color. So you got one, two, three, four, and that's a fifth roof right there. So mm -hmm. five roofs, yeah. all different pitches. Yeah, and you've got a lot going on. You really see the complexity of it all once it's framed. A few weeks ago, our homeowner and her designer showed us the layout for the kitchen, and they pointed out a couple handcrafted features, like a shiplap wall, some floating shelves, and a special wooden detail for our kitchen island. So to pull those off, we have come to rural Pennsylvania. Paul Grothaus opened his woodworking business almost 30 years ago. Today, he's the leading builder of wooden countertops in the country. So where does this start for you, Paul? All right, so we're going to start with here, Kevin, is selecting the lumber. Uh, we're working on the ship lap that goes on the water wall of the kitchen. Right. Um, Karen Swanson, the kitchen designer, has specified flat sawn white oak. And when I say flat sawn, I mean that because she wants to see the cathedrals and the grain that come with flat sawn. Most people right now are looking for rift sawn, which is more linear in grain. Yep. But she actually really wants to feature that grain of the wood that way. So now we're going to flatten one face of the board. We're going to use a machine called a joiner. And this machine has a, a circular helical head on the bottom that actually spins really fast. It actually has carbide inserts. And the reason we use this head is so that it doesn't tear out the wood and it also is easily sharp and we just replace the carbide inserts. Uh, so this is our planer. It's a pretty special planer. It has uh, a bottom head actually. So that face we jointed, it'll get rejointed on that cutter head. And you'll see that there's actually fingers up here that he uses to hold against the finger head. So this kind of does like an automated level of joinery. After it does that, there's a back cutter head back there that'll actually uh, do the top head and then it'll be plain parallel. So two sides at once. So how many passes do you think? One time through. This is a straight line rip saw. I've not seen one of these before. Yeah, this is an industrial level table saw basically. So this machine uses a very accurate conveyor and pressure bar up top that presses down on the board and it basically pulls the wood through the blades. Very accurate. We can cut up to 16 feet with a very straight cut. And once we go through, they'll rip one face, they'll flip it over and then clean rip the other side. Cool. This is a big belt sander. It has three different belts on it. Rougher, smoother, smoothest. And essentially we're going to Sand one face of the board. Oh yeah. So we just gotta run the ship laps on the edges. And so now we're gonna machine the edges for the ship lap, Kevin. I got a little mock up here of what it's gonna look like. So they've called to have this go vertical up the wall. So Correct. we're gonna be going up like this. And it's gonna get installed with a little gap. Yep. And that gap will allow for expansion contraction. All right. And that's created because we've got uh, 
these dados here on opposing sides. They'll create the gap in the field by hand. Exactly. Look at that. That's going to be a great look right there. And so what is the final finish that we're getting on these? So we're going to be actually bleaching the wood because uh, they want a light finish. And then we're going to top coat that. Show off the oak, right? Exactly. They want to see the grain, but not a dark color. Beautiful. Some of those cathedrals right there. And then you're doing countertops for us as well. That's right. We're doing an island countertop. We're doing a wall countertop. And we're also doing some floating shelves. And we're going to go to the other plant to see those right now. Now we're in the office, customer service, engineering. This is Steve. Steve, this is Kevin. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, Kevin, this is the drawings that the designers send us. And what we have to do is take those drawings and put them into our 3D CAD so we can develop a, a full model of what the actual countertops and kitchen look like. So that's the shiplap that we just made right there, then that's the accent wall. Right, and you can also see the floating shelves there that we're going to be doing for the project as well. And then just opposite of that is where our island is? Exactly. And this is where I take over. So we always start with the cabinetry. You know, we can't change those sizes. Uh, so from there, we put the stone on. And the stone basically sits, now in this particular application, we're going to be flush with the actual back and uh, left hand side here. Right. The only overhang is going to be on the front side. Okay. From there we want our countertop kind of flanking around the outside to generate a little bit of overhang there. So that's where the wood comes together with the stone. And again, this is homeowner designer choice. They said this is what they want. Yeah, most people like wood for seating because it's more yeah. warm. Okay. Now this is where it gets a little challenging because we want this wood kind of just floating on the outside here. <laughs> yeah, there's and, nothing supporting and, it. And in the past we always did corbels. We basically would just put corbels kind of uh, in each one of the corners there. Uh, in this particular case though, they don't want to see corbels, so they want that floating look. So okay. in, in order to do that, I have to kind of hide these brackets up underneath uh, the actual counter itself. So those so, are let into the countertop itself? Correct, actually both into the wood countertop and the stone countertop. So underneath here, um, I actually kind of have the bracket setting in place, and those are going to be kind of tucked underneath the wood as well as the stone itself. So stone guy has got to now put a big dado in the bottom of his stone, a channel to, to receive them? That is correct. One of the other things too, between the two surfaces butting uh, against each other, one of the things we always like to do is we like to put a rabbit over top of those. That eliminates any crumb cutters. So when you kind of put two surfaces next to each other, you create this kind of ridge line between those. Yeah. So we want to re remove that crumb cutter ledge. So once you design it here, Steve, can you also ship the design or all the instructions down to have this cut? Correct, yep. So that takes you through the CNC process. All right, well, let's go see it get cut. Let's do it. Sounds good. This is the CNC machine. This is what we're going to use to machine out the countertop and actually route in the bracket locations. So this is basically a giant robot with a huge router attached. Now we're going to machine out the spot for the bracket. This will be one pass done. That is so satisfying. <laughs> a lot easier to do it by hand, that's for sure. That's unbelievable. Yeah, super smooth. And then here's the brackets we're going to use. Yeah. And you can see we leave room around it for expansion contraction because wood does expand and contract. And also, we don't want the guys at installation to have to make sure they install it, you know, to like the 16th or something right. like that. So this one's done. You'll do the exact same process with the two wings right there. Right. The other two pieces will get machined exactly the same way. They're just a little smaller. Right. And then as you say, installation is key. And, and you're on the hook for that, right? You're going to help us make sure that all of this comes together with both the stone and the wood. Right. So our team will be out to install the brackets. The stone guys will install their top over that, and then we'll come out and install the wood top. Awesome. Well, we'll see you at the project, but thanks for everything you showed us here and all this great work. Good to see you again. Thanks, Paul. This is tremendous. This is so nice. You know, Charlie, with all the stuff going on in the back of this house, between the addition, the roof lines, that modern look, it's kind of amazing that the front of the house, it's, I mean, it's virtually untouched, just like we found it. And really, that's by design. Changing the windows, saving as much of the clapboards we can, scraping, painting, corner boards, et cetera. And believe it or not, we're even going to make an attempt at saving this door and refinishing it. Yeah, why not? And we don't even have to change these stairs, even though they don't meet code. But because of existing conditions, we don't have to, and the homeowners are okay with it. But up here in the dormer, we have something to do. 
As you can see, the sheathing on the other side, our wood shingles are nailed to that. Mm. And you can even see our roof boards and our asphalt shingles are nailed to that. Talk about existing conditions. You got it all day long here. It is. But now, you know, we have to worry about the summer as well as the winter time. Asphalt shingles, what, 120, 130 degrees? That heat's radiating in. Yeah. So we only have a two inch depth to play with here. Could you build it out? We don't have room. We have all the new windows and they're all the same size as what we have, so we can't even build anything out. So okay. existing conditions, we don't have to bring it to code, but we do want to improve on it. And the solution is we have this two inch foam with a foil on both sides. Yeah. Our value of 13. Pretty good for two inches. Not bad. All right, so what, cut and install? Yeah, you want to give me a hand? Yeah. Give me a measurement of the uh, bay there. Far bay first? Far bay first, yeah. All right, so I'll give you a, a one. This is actually pretty parallel. It looks like 11 and three quarters will do it. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna put this one in. Thank you. All right, so we, wait, Charlie said 11 and three quarter. We got. I know, I heard you just fine, but I wanna have a, allowed for a little gap on each side for some spray foam. Do me a favor and keep it down from the top a little also. I want a gap up there too. And you should be able to push that right into place. Okay. These shingle nails actually hold it nicely in place. So let me give you this bay, which is, looks like 13 and an eighth. 13 is my smallest. So what'd you take off? About an inch. So 12 all around. Perfect. Ready? And snap this one. Perfect. Send it up. All right, so now we're going to use the spray foam in the can to go around the edges. This will help insulate as well as hold the foam in place. So you got the window version there, uh, Charlie? Yeah, we have the low expansion. We don't have to fill any big gaps. And now we only have one final step. For our vapor barrier, we're going to use a foil face tape. Vapor barrier. Right. Yeah, we're going to tape over all the seams right to the studs, seal it up right around both sides of it. It'll be perfect. So this foil is a vapor barrier, but you want to make sure that there's no gaps. That's right. Gotcha. And then how about up top? Well, we have plenty of room for our standard spray foam. All right. That's an awesome fix, Charlie. Nice job. It is, and we have two more dormers to go, though. Today we're here with landscape designer Maria Wheeler. Maria? Hello, Jen. How are you? Good, how are you? Great to see you. Great to see you. Let's talk about your intentions for this front landscape. So we are finally here today to put the front landscape in. Um, at this end, we have a native dogwood, mm -hmm. which initially was due to be removed because it's infected with a, a disease known as anthracnose. The disease began in the late 70s, and it's, it's definitely will take down, unfortunately, most of our dogwoods. Clients decide to keep it, so we're going to keep it. I love that they're trying because it looks healthy now. Yep. If it should go into decline, yep. what do you think would go in its place? I had uh, scheduled to put in a hawthorn tree, which is also a native plant. I like to use natives whenever possible. Me so too. should this go into decline, we can always replace it. Okay. Um, we're going to transplant a couple of azaleas that were on the property. Awesome. I've I always love transplants. It's a great time of year to do it as well. I've staked out uh, two varieties of plants that we're going to keep this bed very simple. Okay. We're putting in red chokeberry, which is an aronia. You know what? The berries are going to persist into the fall, yep. and this fall color, when it, it starts going. It has beautiful going. red color. The birds love the berries. It is a native plant. It's mm -hmm. great as a pollinator plant. You also could, if there are any left, make a jelly from them. So another native shrub to integrate right into the setting. That's correct. Yeah. And this and plant? We have this beautiful lilac, which is a Miss Kim lilac. Love them. And it colors in the fall, which is great about this particular variety. I love Miss Kim lilacs. They're beautiful. 
So I've staked out about nine plants here, as you can see. Yep. Um, we try to put them in four to five feet apart. I, do, I really don't like to put plants too close together for circulation, and I wanted to maintain the beauty of the wall and not encroach on that. Right. I love the distance off the wall. It's going to let the plant open yep. up and do its thing. Yep. So that's the idea, and like anything, oftentimes you have to make choices and changes. Mm -hmm. This plant, when we first saw the property, it was not in leaf or blossom. Right. When we saw the blossoms, we recognized it as a heritage Rosa Ragosa, and it was quite spectacular. It hasn't been pruned and touched probably in decades. Right. It's encroached by an ampelopsis vine. It's invasive. It's quite invasive. Right, it's, it's starting to strangle. So Mary is starting with that, taking that out of the plant. Mm -hmm. And normally the next stage with roses, we usually prune when you can see the form of the plant a little better, but we're doing what you call more like a renewal pruning or renovation pruning. Right, let the air in. Okay, so Jen, I think we should site these plants. You put that one there. Okay. And this one is, keep it out of the way of Mary. Okay, so let's grab these transplants. These are azaleas from the yard. Right. That we pulled out. They're in pretty good And shape. that's a spreading azalea, so that's gonna go hereabouts. Okay. Right about here. I'm gonna put this right about here. It should fill up the space quite nice. And the fact that they were a part of the property, it's nice to be able to save them. Right, and it adds some life to this yep, corner. a little bit of life. Great. So we're ready to put an evergreen tree in this spot. As you can see, the men are already got the hole dug. Right. Um, we're sighting it now to make sure it's front back, correct direction of it. Always pick the face that you're facing. Right, so the face, so we want to turn it just a little bit. You got it. I think that's pretty I good. Let me look around. Good. That's great. It's a lovely plant. Blue spruce. It's a Picea pungens bakeri. Mm -hmm. So it's a dwarf um, variety. The homeowner wishes to put holiday lights on this. Mm -hmm. They don't want an enormous evergreen. Right. But it will be tall enough to give them a nice little display. Yeah, and I really like the blue foliage. It adds something different. Excellent choice for this corner. So Maria, great job here. See you on the next round. Thank you. You're welcome. Next time on This Old House. Our homeowner Megan is keeping some of the design work in the family. Her mother Fran has taken on the artistic task of making them a very special outdoor dining table. Well, the design is a koi pond. Okay. With uh, lots of lily pads, yeah, lots those. of fish. and. We have a small solution to a big challenge in remodeling HVAC. This is the first time for me putting this type of unit in. <laughs>